light coming in during the day when I'm typically at my computer through the beautiful window view. Um, I don't have a lot of light uh, for video broadcasting in the evening. And unfortunately, um, but it still turned out to be a good day. I was scheduled to go to and meet some folks um, at the Trump rally in Reading, uh, PA today. Uh, and they had moved the time up and I just happened to notice that email while I was in the midst of compiling my my notes for today's message and kind of had to cut it short until I got home back uh, about an hour ago and in between cooking dinner and uh, or letting that cook and uh, coming back in here was able to get prepared for today's study. Um, it is entitled, Get Out of Your Head, Renewing Our Minds. And I'm sure we all have uh, wondered what it would take for us to just feel content. Um, when we listen to lies about our true worth, we naturally just as humans withdraw and push others back and enter into a state of isolation and feeling of worthlessness or a lack of value. Uh, but truth be told, the enemy of our souls um, knows that we require one another and desires daily to put a wedge between us and what God has intended for us and um, this is one of the tricks that he uses a trick um, he uses on all of us at one time or another um, you know like he used tricks in the Garden of Eden so I've just wrapped up a six session Bible study uh, by Jenny Allen entitled get out of your head um, where she primarily uses scripture from Philippians, but some other scripture as well, to show us how to take control of the wrong thoughts that cause us to, as she puts it, spiral down into feelings of worthlessness, failure, unworthiness, um, the absence of love, and, and so much more. And for the most part, this study is one you would either have to purchase or be part of a group. Um, I, as a group leader for many years, had access to or still have access to Right Now Media, which is where I am able to get these studies um, and also order support material for teaching small groups and so forth. But um, I've changed my serving capacity to media and production here um, at my new church in Pennsylvania. And of course, they do not have exactly the same ministries um, for small groups and so forth. They have small groups, but they use a different format. Um, so, but this is just a, a service that I'm able to keep um, for as long as. I guess the company exists. Um, however, you know, since most of you can't access this and may not need to make the investment, um, you know, I use them typically for my own devotions. But when I see something that fits with what God's been putting on my heart to publish out to Reflections of the Savior, Obviously, I'm going to extrapolate from those personal devotions as well to bring to you um, 
you know, information and so forth. However, if some folks do um, add to the comments that they'd like to be part of some more formalized online Bible studies, um, I can do Bible studies virtually through um, the right now media software application. So, you know, always uh, ping me on uh, the comments or those of you that know me personally can go to my profile and private message me there. Uh, be happy to get a small group together and go through some some various uh, video based Bible studies uh, with you all where we go through a chapter at a time each week and um, work with some workbooks and so forth to help us. So, um, so that's just kind of a, a side note. Um, <clears throat> so in the spirit, in that spirit, and as an adjunct to my recent reflections video on forsaking not the assembling of ourselves where I went into some details on habits of complacency that may have um, either increased or even plagued some people that didn't previously struggle with this um, because of doing church at home for so long because of COVID. Um, I really felt impressed to speak about what I learned during this study on my own um, and found it relative or relevant, um, you know, to what I spoke about last week, I believe it was when I did that video. Um, so in this one, I'm not going to detail, though it's going to seem pretty long. Um, she talks a lot quicker than me, so we probably have about the same amount of notes, but she would go through it in 20 minutes and, and I would take a little bit longer. But uh, I'm really going to be struggling, or not struggling, focusing on session four, which was titled The Weapons We Fight, and it happened to be part two of The Weapons We Fight, and I felt it was the most relevant. So let's dive in, starting with scientifically proven attribute of the human brain called mirror neurons. And that was the first time that I had actually heard about that. Um, they actually, mirror neurons, actually are responsible for us mimicking the behavior of others as though the observer, us looking at the other person, were themselves taking on um, or t acting as the person they are facing. So when you're sitting across from a friend at like a coffee table um, over coffee, um, your mirror neuron systems are part of this process. The process causes the muscles in your face um, to mimic what your friend's face is doing, which helps both parties to feel what the other person is feeling more accurately. So we would commonly refer to this as expressions, but our expressions start syncing together and actually improve the communication um, That, which is something that can only occur when we're in a face-to-face -face conversation, an intimate conversation, much much like God designed us to, uh, to be in. Um, it wasn't God who invented cell phones and social media and, and other things, though so those are great. Um, we can never forget the importance, and that's what this is about, about our need to be um, involved with one another. So what is so powerful is that this level of empathy is an automatic response of our bodies uh, that has been built in to respond to each other and is clearly part of God's plan for our further supporting that everything about our bodies and emotions and much else in 
how we are created support um, how we are hardwired for connection or more plainly relationships. Even God himself whose image we are made in lives in relationship as the Trinity and created us to live in relationship with others and him as well. So, however, as always, the enemy of our soul, um, much as he did in the garden, is always at work trying to sever God's design and God's plan for relationships. Our generation in particular is being attacked in ways that tend to destroy and break down relationships. The enemy is using things like victimhood um, and division and distress, um, cynicism, complacency, and distraction. And he uses them to make our minds distracted as Jenny refers to as spiraling down and inevitably messing up the relationships in our lives. But the good news is we have a defense as God in his infinite wisdom has given us the weapons to cut through and interrupt the spirals so that our relationships cannot just mature, but they can flourish. But unfortunately that does not come automatic for us and requires, um, a choice to retrain our thoughts um, to rid ourselves of the deceptive lies and be very intentional about taking the path God intended for us and not the easy road that the enemy very subtly tricks us into. So digging into Philippians 2 we can pull out three weapons um, that we can use to fight the enemy and disrupt his plan of disrupting God's plan of community for believers. So we're going to read in the chapter, uh, beginning with verse 1, but I'll take us in through verse 11 just to add a little bit more context for later on in the study. Um, so in verse 1 in Philippians 2, um, I believe I pulled this out in the English Standard Version. Um, it reads, So if there is any encouragement in Christ and comfort from love and participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, doing nothing selfish of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing he grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the name that is above all names, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in the heaven and on earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, wow, a mouthful there, huh? And this is the goal for us, a single-mindedness, community relationship. Now, being honest with you, this does not really depict the image 
of how our world feels today. And quite frankly, it feels like all hell is coming against um, community, both outside and in the church um, at the same time. It became especially noticed, especially noticeable in 2020 with the added isolation and the different situations that we had to follow um, in our form of doing church um, that added to the isolation um, that because of certain decisions made by local government pertaining to COVID and what you were and weren't allowed to do. Um, although this breakdown of real community as the Bible describes it existed well before COVID, I see it in the church right now more so following the seven or nine months that people grew comfortable with doing church um, at home. And while many have returned, like at the church that I attend, um, and we're only into like the third service um, tomorrow, and I see us quickly having to expand back to three services um, and who knows what from there because people are, are quickly coming back. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there are people, you know, that grew comfortable with doing church at home. And while many, like I said, have returned to the churches since they've reopened, many have fallen into the lie of complacency and if it was good enough for the last x number of months why not now it breaks my heart because the bible says the way they know us is by our love and we are looking less and less the way god intended us to each and every year that people become more complacent and less dedicated to their commitment and their following with Christ. Um, but that further, um, those lies further penetrated from the enemy during this period of isolation, especially for those who are prone to feeling like they can do things on their own. Um, so, you know, again, I need to get back on track because I, I kind of have lived from my notes there a little bit. Um, so we are looking less and less the way God intended us to. And that only exists when the body follows God's plan for church, as I outlined in my last video, uh, but truly boils down to the assembling of ourselves as the body of Christ at church and in small groups or close friendships. And it should be a mixture of all, not just one or the other. Um, it is heart-wrenching that our world has so much hurt, isolation and distrust that comes from people being horrible to each other. And while I know that there is hope in God, there are times to grieve, even to grieve how we ourselves have been complacent or participated in things that can cause disunity. Um, knowing all this, we can even blame each other. You know, how can we even blame each other for getting into these negative spirals um, when the real depiction of what we should be doing as a church is intended to keep us safe from pain. But if we don't feel safe from pain, um, you know, because we're not doing community right, we spiral down into the lies that the enemy paints into our head. Um, and we falsely are led to believe that that is the solution. This isolation, this, this staying by ourselves is, 
is the solution to avoiding the pain and the, the discomfort and, and the hurts that we have. So when I think of weapons that Jenny discussed last week, um, which was the study, the series before, um, which I actually did them in less than a week, not one a week. Um, so it was humility, stillness, and delight. I think about how they all come from spending time with God. And as a direct result of loving God, we in turn learn to love each other. Um, because if we're spending time in his word, we're seeing that that is the key focal point is love. Jesus said, the second is likened to the first command, love one another as I have loved you. Um, and he correlated that with, if we do that, then we will just automatically fulfill the law. Um, when you look at God, you are so moved by his love, so moved by his grace, so moved by what he did for us, so moved by his character just in general, that you literally cannot contain yourself if you're truly looking at the glory of God. You keep going back to find your delight in him. You seek his goodness every day every morning you rise and you you know you may not feel like it on some days but you know you you profess this is the day the Lord has made I will rejoice um, you reach out and all of a sudden you want to connect with others which is how we're supposed to live and why God designed it that way it puts an end to these negative spirals that are so negative and divide us and cause us to not grow as mature believers. So let's go back to the single-mindedness that Paul was talking about. And I believe it comes as we take risk for God and step out of our comfort zones and move into the things God has called us to. But given our own devices, there's no more extreme comfort zone for some of us than doing the opposite of God's plan and stepping into isolation and wrapping ourselves up, protecting ourselves from the very community that we were built for. We sit in our homes secluded watching Netflix or whatever it happens to be scrolling through Facebook and Instagram, or even falling into complacency of doing church online pre and post church closures instead of actually having real conversations um, and pursuing people because it does take being intentional. We may even feel as the enemy would want us to believe that we are growing in our walk with God on our own more so than we did as a community um, and traveling to our churches. Um, that he, And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, because when we're out of the absence of God, our community, our accountability um, partners that God has placed into our life. Um, I, th I think I posted something the other day, you know, how do you jumpstart a battery with a dead battery? Um, my old pastor used to say, if you're the smartest one in your small group, then find another group. So we can't grow in the things of God. We cannot accomplish the things that God has for us in isolation. So that is a flat out lie. If you, if you believe that by doing your growth with God entirely by yourself, um, instead of how God has prescribed it, 
yes, we need our time alone with God. But if the majority of your time with God is in isolation, is with self and God, then you are not growing in the things of God. You are stagnant and you were right where Satan wants you. Um, you know, again, like this is a flat out lie from the pit of hell to keep you useless for the kingdom of God. Sure, some people are shut in for various health reasons and have less opportunity or less control over that situation. But in their case, they just need to trust in the Lord that he will find a way to bring community to them because they are shut in and unable to seek it otherwise. So when we fall into these lies, our relationships are broken down and we're desiring, ironically, the very things that we're running from. We want to feel seen. We want to feel loved. It's the foundation and framework for which we build and thrive and experience God's true presence. And when it's missing, everything around us seems to crumble and it seems pointless and disappearing, which is rampant right now in today's society. There are reasons why John in the epistles wrote so bold statements about our love for others. And you cannot say you love others if you avoid them. Um, and these are key indicators of whether we truly love God or not, as he so boldly puts it. And here's the worst thing. And... Um, Jenny quotes Larry Krauss, who says um, it this way, that no lie is more often believed than the lie that we can know God without someone else knowing us. So very clearly he is stating that we cannot say, it's just like John says, if you claim to love God but hate your brother, and hating your brother doesn't necessarily mean hatred. It means not seeking them as God prescribes in the definition of community. Now, of course, if you hate them, that makes the matter even worse. But what this Larry Krauss is quoting is basically saying that you cannot you know if you claim that you are in relationship with God and you know God, but you don't know his children who he has commanded you to fellowship and form tight relationships with for good reasons, then you are a liar. You can't know God if you don't know others. So simply put, we cannot know God without knowing others. We were built to be seen and loved and that's exactly why the enemy of our soul wants to take that from us. The first attack distraction keeps us from seeking help from God and the chaos in our minds. The second attack keeps us from pulling others in for help. So why do we do, why do we go along with this? Um, taking from the quote of Kurt Hobston, who pointed out that every human struggles in his life. If anyone really knew or knew us or knew the thoughts that we were capable in our heads, they would leave us in a heartbeat is what most people really believe. And yes, we think that if people only knew that we what we've done, um, no one would want anything to do with us. If people knew the thoughts that each of us has um, and is capable of thinking, they'd want us out of their lives. Or perhaps there are wrong thoughts on our end, um, which these are all on our end, but where we think that why would I bother somebody else with my problems? They're mine, not theirs. Well, that's not what the Bible says. After all, 
I can, you know, and further wrong thinking is, after all, I can handle this by myself. What good is it going to let someone in any way focus on negative things um, by letting someone else know? Well, the Bible very clearly states bringing things out into the light, um, taking uh, correction from one another, giving correction to one another. How can you do that? if you're in isolation and you believe all these lies. So when we listen to these lies about our worth, we naturally back away from everybody. But when we push people away, it becomes a classic mind game, um, a self-fulfilling prophecy where our lack of faith and insecurity in what the Bible, sorry, I need to flip pages and Paper was a little sticky. Bible says is trumped by the enemy's lies, which feeds isolation and leads us to believe that we are worthless and nobody really gets us or cares about us, which is not the truth. Um, we feel unseen and unloved and to protect ourselves from further rejection, and ironically, rejection that we're actually creating because we believe the lies of the enemy, we won't let anyone close enough to change the way we see others. We may even take every action possible to block someone completely out of our lives because we don't want to hear the truth. Um, and so gradually we embrace these lies and we have to do life on our own and we isolate ourselves to avoid pain and the truth is that we are designed in the image of God, the one who embodies community and who invites us into his family because he knows the model for living a healthy and productive life as sons and daughters of the Most High and has designed us for community to handle the very problems that we have been tricked into believing our isolation will resolve. So we require each other in our lives. We require each other, but I think because we've been hurt, at many of us, um, we've pulled back and we've missed the plans of God, which part of the plan of God is for us growing up together and maturing in the body. Oh, excuse me, in the body. We need to be able to work through incredibly difficult things that would typically cause division. But guys, gals, we have gotten way, way, way too comfortable in our immaturity at running away from each other rather than following God's rules and plans for healthy relationships. That is what first graders do, not what adult believers should be doing. We are called to grow up in the body of Christ. We are called to mature, and that maturity looks like being able to disagree and still love one another. That maturity looks like being able to call out a weakness or sin in each other and to receive a call out on a weakness or sin in ourselves. And so community as followers of God um, is supposed to be this running after Jesus, which yields a single mindedness, togetherness, where we have the same mind have the same right view of God together when we're running hard after Christ and doing life by God's design as a community. When we run after Christ like this, our sin and our weights fall off because they become proportionately smaller and grow dimmer and dimmer when compared to the light of Christ in our life and in our pursuit of him. It puts things in true perspective and diffuses the enemy's lies 
that we can have a relationship with God without having a relationship with others. And all these issues with self-worth and protection and guarding ourselves instead of the transparency that God so desires us to have with our brothers and sisters in Christ and the people that he puts into our lives. Um, we have less time to think about ourselves, so we stop being selfish um, because we start serving other people. And when we're involved in relationships around us and more time to focus on Christ because we need him. So let's dig back into Philippians 2 and what Paul says to the church that's having trouble connecting. So get ready as this can be really challenging for us to talk about, especially with maturity in Christ being key, and that is to seek Christ and do community without grumbling or disputing. <laughs> Something that we um, do quite frequently, but when we do it without grumbling and disputing, we may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a twisted generation where because of Christ and community, we shine in the eyes of others as lights in the world, holding fast to the word and life through God's lenses. So when you think about the first part of that, it scares you that potentially grumbling and disputing can even derail a ministry. It scares us because it also pertains to each and every one of us and it's common and it's so easy to grumble and complain. And as scripture says, it is well um, as not reconciling with those we have hurt where God tells you to leave your gift at the altar um, if you have offended anybody that both of these situations can hinder our relationship and prayers with God unless we take control of these situations and we follow God's plan for healthy relationships. So it's a spiral we're all afflicted with at different points in our life. But again, God has given us the weapons to find him, and this helps us to recognize the lies of the enemy of our mind that keep us so fixated on something other than God and one another, um, and we lose sight of his will for our lives. We start believing the lie that we are at the mercy of our circumstances but that is not the truth. The truth is we have choice and we, can, and we can continue to be the center of our thoughts, self-centered, or we can set Christ at the center of our thoughts and that will lead us to where we become selfless and concerned about others and we begin to develop a servant's heart and we begin to grasp and hold on tightly to why God values community so much. And when we do that, our minds shift and they shift and it shifts toward gratitude. And it's interesting as gratitude is a powerful thing and we know this from scripture that Paul had endured horrific abuse and all kinds of trouble. He was beaten up, left for dead multiple times, and yet at the center of his world was joy, contentment, and gratitude. In a victimhood culture, Paul certainly, by his behavior, would have stood out um, and been a draw to those who did not know Christ. And that is the desire that God has for all of us. Now, I'm not saying that there are no real victims 
in life or that we have no right to speak out refusing to be a slave to our circumstances doesn't mean we don't fight for what's right scripture actually commands us to fight in fact by acting justly crying out for justice and defending the cause of the oppressed that in Christ we can not we can fight not from a place of insecurity and outrage but a place of reconciliation and calm confidence of peace because our victory is certain in Christ Jesus we've already won I'm telling you that's far better way than grumbling or complaining see we weren't built to live ourselves we were built to have freedom to do whatever we want um, we were built to have freedom to do whatever we want no that's not how we were built I'm sorry I typed that wrong we were not built to have freedom to do whatever we want we have the free will to choose to do whatever we want but not without consequence so here's how Jenny in the session sort of describes a struggle that she personally went through in her own life so I'll read I'll read that and it's almost verbatim more or less um, though I since it was her testimony I didn't really change much to it but for a long time dissolution stole her energy and her desire to serve when she walked through that season of doubt she grew complacent she checked out she wanted to binge watch Netflix or get lost on social media she wanted to cry she wanted to escape and because the devil is subtle in setting us up for this behavior her craving for these things kept growing and her passion for the things that of God weakened she had no desire to go to the grocery store let alone to the nations and tell people about God and this is how the enemy takes us so this is how he takes us out and this is not at all how we were meant to live we were built to be part of an eternal story focused on one purpose service to an unmatched God so the enemy throws complacency at us and he rewrites the script entirely where it is about us and not about one another it's no longer about the bigger story it's no longer about the mission that goes on forever it's about the here and now and it's about selfishness because they're lies from the pit of hell so complacency finds us and makes us want comfort more than we want God and as we accept the complacency we start to just live out the status quo and kind of check out zone out numb out and our highest aim becomes not rocking the boat so we ask ourselves again as I started out what is going to take for us to feel content we want to be content that is the chase that is what we're after and the funny thing is that God knows that where we will find contentment is actually not thinking so much about ourselves um, and the way we do this is to live in community to run after um, chase after the things of God to grow up in faith to follow God even though it's not easy and even though we don't always feel like it on certain days um, we reject passivity and we lean into the needs around us and we see our minds set on the things of God God is never passive God is always working for our good and his glory and we are to be like him and the interesting thing 
the biggest, best weapon I have ever seen for this in my own personal life is service. I have seen this in my own life again and again as I am running my race and as I am obeying God. And you know what's interesting? The sin and the weight just fall off when I set my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, because I need him, because I'm running my guts out and I need him as I serve people. Um, as a result, we become more holy. It actually, it's actually how we were built. Ironically, in fact, scientists will tell you science, not the Bible, but the Bible does too. But science will tell you that when we serve, there's a part of our brain that rewards us um, because it loves it. Like you, we were built to be most happy when serving. Our brain actually works this way, like God built us to be most happy, expanding our lives for the glory of God and for the good of people to be poured out to be an offering. That is what we were built for. We were built for service. We were built for connection, but we miss both because we're afraid and we fall for the lies. So that is the spiral that has to shift in order for us to live the way that God wants us to live rather than being a slave to the lies of the devil. We need to say no more to the lies and bring ourselves out of the dark where we can lie, where we can lie and live in denial and bring that into the light where we can learn to trust God's plan and grow in relationship with our church family. We're going to break that cycle. We're going to value coming together and let those closest to us in faith know we are doing, we are going to be bold. We are going to move out of our comfort zone. We are going to confess something. Um, we are going to be honest about it. Very much like baptism where you're making a profession in front of your church community um, for accountability purposes that you are acknowledging your plan to follow Jesus. Um, so you're going to come out of this hiding place and this is breaking the cycle. This is breaking and interrupting the spirals. We take risk to do this. We come out of hiding. We refuse to be complacent. We take a risk to serve in a way that may even be uncomfortable or may even be a little bit scary and might potentially even um, reap some rejection because it's possible. I mean, not everybody coming to church when I used to do computer check-in came in all happy. Some of them battled the whole way, husband and wife and the kids on the way to church, and that was still showing very heavy in their facial emotions, their neuro, uh, whatever that phrase was at the beginning of the... Um, Thing as they came to approach us. Um, so, you know, sometimes things can, can be a little bit rocky when we're serving because we're serving people and we're, we're flawed. Um, we take a risk when we serve in a way that's uncomfortable um, and even when we're scared. So, but we do it anyway because it's worth it no matter what the cost is. That is how we were meant to live. It is God's perfect plan and he created it with the same love he created each and every one of us. So he created us with the ultimate love, but he also created the plan for us with that same level of love because he knew in order for us to truly know him, we needed to know and trust one another 
and to embrace this thing called community and transparency with our brothers and sisters in Christ and those he has placed in our lives to help us in our journey and in our walk as believers in Christ Jesus until that day that we dwell in his heavenly place eternally with one another forever <laughs> can't think of a better word than forever um, but I guess that's kind of the same thing as eternally but I hope you enjoyed it I know it was a little bit long I'm not as quick a talker as uh, Jenny and I think she pays attention to her notes that are probably pinned up on the wall uh, behind the camera or something like that instead of sliding down on the laptop like I have to deal with um, and is probably in bigger print. Um, I'm just making some assumptions based on previous experience and so forth. So I apologize for being a little bit long. But I think there's a lot of meat in what we studied today and I hope you all got something out of it. Be blessed. Love you. Got to look for my mouse here under the pile of paperwork so I can stop the stream. Um, be blessed. Have a great Sunday tomorrow and start putting some of this to work for you at church tomorrow. Or if you're not yet going to church, start letting this penetrate into your thought process and, and resist the devil and he will flee and seek the things of God and seek Christ and follow his plan for community. Love you all. Stay blessed.